My name is Yao Yao. I came from Jiajiang, China. I've been in Russia for about 10 years. I used to study here. After my study, I came to this Chinese-owned enterprise. We now have more than a thousand employees in Russia. 85% of them are local people. Half of them provide technical services. I've been in St. Petersburg for more than 10 years. I work in the Chinese food industry. I am still at a loss sometimes. We don't know whether it's really going to be profitable. These three generations of Chinese came to Russia at different times in search of their careers. Their stories are footprints of economic cooperation between China and Russia in the last 20 years. What will this part of Sino-Russian cooperation lead to? This Products Information Service Center in St. Petersburg was set up to promote products and services to corporate clients. Though staffed by Russians, it's owned by Huawei, a Chinese telecommunications equipment provider. Huawei entered the Russian market in the mid-90s. By now, it's become one of the main networks and communication technology providers in Russia. The low cost of Chinese products was a major advantage for the company when it first entered the Russian market. At the end of the 90s, we were mainly producing data exchange machines. Each exchange machine and household telephone cost about 300 US dollars. We were able to offer a very advantageous price because we had our own R&D. We also provided high-capacity data exchange machines at very competitive prices. This market had long been monopolized. With its competitive low production cost, Huawei's business expanded steadily. More than a decade later, its business could be found throughout Russia. The company has developed joint ventures with Russia's principal carriers as well as the government. Today it has over 1,000 employees, most of them are local Russians. Any enterprise that has expanded overseas needs to localize its overseas operations. This is inevitable. It has to enlarge its local investment and then set up a wage system that suits the local people. This is a great challenge. There are many foreign companies and Chinese companies that have come to Russia. Their main difficulty is using locals to develop their business. Since the mid-90s, Chinese merchants have been coming to Russia. However, most of them have come as individuals rather than in the form of an enterprise like Huawei. I did everything, like mopping the floor, buying food, etc. I just felt good, really good. I didn't know why at the time. In 1994, Sing Jun Li left her hometown in Harbin to study in St. Petersburg, which only had one Chinese restaurant then, despite being the second largest city in Russia. Upon graduating in 1998, Sing and her friend rented a street shop to open a Chinese restaurant. We knew nothing then. The day we opened the restaurant, we realized that we didn't even have a signboard. Then he managed to find a board and painted a name on it and mounted it at the entrance. Many Chinese came to do business with Russia then. They set up stalls to sell clothes, electrical appliances and other China-made consumer goods. They knew little about Russia's laws, society, culture and economy. Singh was no different. That's why she was caught flat-footed when the 1998 financial crisis broke out. I was totally unprepared mentally. The customers suddenly stopped coming. All shops, including food shops, clothes suppliers, shoe sellers, all demanded settlement in US dollars. Singh persevered. When other shops demanded US dollars in payment, she continued to let her customers pay in rubles. Eventually, the Russian economy recovered, and so did the business of her Chinese restaurant. She now has more than 10 branches. Okay. 
we weren't really prepared psychologically, but in hindsight, I think the most important thing is the ability to endure. Even in today's circumstances, we should learn more about the general economic situation of this country. Individuals who came to Russia to do business in the 90s were called briefcase traders. That's history now. As Russia and China developed, each in its own path, the economic collaboration between them has now risen to a strategic level rather than just mere cooperation between enterprises. Since the mid-2000s, the scale of Chinese investment in Russia has been increasing. This is the Red Village district in the southwestern part of St. Petersburg. The Baltic Pearl, China's largest overseas estate project, will be built here. Both governments attach great importance to this project. The Baltic Pearl is a multifunction modern community comprising business, accommodation and commerce. It has a development area of 208 hectares, which will house up to 35,000 people. These Chinese construction contractors are global leaders in the industry, and we're interested in having them do some projects in Russia. Of course, we would also like them to use their credit or investment capabilities to help develop these projects in Russia. In the 1950s, the former Soviet Union offered direct economic aid to China. It supplied technology and personnel to assist China in its infrastructural and industrial development. The two countries had a similar approach to economic development. Later on, ideological differences dampened the relationship between the two countries. After the disintegration of the Soviet Union, China established diplomatic relations with Russia. However, by then, after half a century, the two nations' economic development was very different. The low cost of labor has enabled China's light industries and consumer products to grow rapidly since the opening up of the country. With its rapid development, the demand for natural resources has also increased. However, Russia is vast but sparsely populated. Its economy relies heavily on the export of resources and heavy industries, while there's constant shortage of consumer products. In 2008, Russia imported 34.7 billion US dollars worth of goods from China, a rise of 40% over 2007, making China its largest import nation. The same year, China also became Russia's largest export nation in Asia, with a volume up to 22.15 billion US dollars, an increase of one third over the year before. You know, in terms of infrastructure hardware, China is in general definitely ahead of Russia. When it comes to mindset, software, cosmopolitan outlook, understanding of the world, um, educated about the world, Russia is ahead of China. With 20 years of experience teaching business studies in China, Wilfred van Honecker is now Dean of Skolkovo, the Moscow School of Management. He believes that closer strategic cooperation is important to the long-term development of both Russia and China, the two fastest developing countries in the world. If you look at China, uh, one of the things that China does not have is a lot of natural resources, apart from people. They have lots of people, but okay. Russia has lots of natural resources, few people. So, given that they are bordering nations and they have a huge you know, border that they share. It's, it's natural that they work together because they need one another in terms of economic development. And that will require a you know, cultural understanding, respect and appreciation. The crisis has shown us that Russia and China are only a few of the countries in the world that are attractive for investments. When the Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, visited China in September 2010, the two countries signed a series of agreements on economic cooperation, including exporting energy resources to China. Back in 2008, the Chinese government promised to gradually increase its investment in Russia, from 2 billion US dollars in 2010 to 12 billion US dollars in 2020. The two countries now have a new momentum and impulse for development. We are looking at specific ways to invest and specific projects that could enhance our cooperation. 
To encourage direct investment, the Russian government plans to enact new systems and laws on taxation, property rights examination and approval criteria. Some time ago, the Russian government was still quite reluctant to support individual investors. The situation has changed, and we are trying to maximize our support and demonstrate our good intentions and readiness to help them. We have come a long way since the border trades in the past to today's cooperation between large enterprises, including cooperative projects at government levels. The most important thing now is to raise the level of our cooperation. When Chinese companies first entered the Russian market, they were selling cheap communication equipment. Nowadays, they're providing advanced network technology. So, for Chinese companies to gain a foothold in Russia, they need to respond to the changing environment by developing new levels of cooperation.